So welcome back, everybody. We now have um, the conclusion of our 2012 oriented talks for the weekend. Um, and uh, we have Nathan Lewis Williams, who's going to be discussing his research on Galactic Center um, and how appropriate it is and how it fits in with some of the stuff we've been looking at over the weekend. So um, Nathan's also a bard, although he doesn't like me to call him that. Um, a poet, a singer, songwriter, and a brilliant sound man, and part of our crew. So uh, please give a warm welcome to Nathan Lewis Williams. Thank you, Hugh. It's always nice to be called a bard. Um, if I were to call myself one, that would be silly. Um, I do sing songs, and I've written poetry uh, since I was young. And um, I'm going to be presenting a talk on the centre of the galaxy. It's kind of a personal perspective. It's become more of a personal talk, this one. Um, I started doing this talk a few years ago when I felt that there was a lack of clarity around the, the 2012 subject, and I wanted to bring some very simple information through, which I felt wasn't being discussed. Um, I'm very glad to find that over the, over the last few years, more and more people have been starting to understand what galactic alignment really is, um, what the Mayans did and didn't say about 2012, and that has been covered very well by other speakers. I will go over some of that ground again, and um, I imagine there will be people in here now already who weren't at Mark Healy's talk that's just been. Um, Mark's talk, I thought, was, was wonderful, and congratulations to him for such a lucid talk. Um, could we just have a quick show of hands just so that I know if I'm covering ground again? How many people who are here now have just heard Mark Healy's talk? Uh, quite a few of you. Okay, so I'll be careful not to go over old ground. And um, also, um, I'm going to keep this short so that we can get back on, on schedule. I'm kind of filling in because we've had a, ca a cancellation. But it's great to be able to do this talk because there, there's some stuff here that isn't being said by other people. Some of it's original research and some of it is, is my own ideas on the Galactic Centre because not being a scientist I feel I'm able to take um, perhaps a more global view of this and maybe connect with the way that ancient peoples from around the world and not just the, the Mayans um, may have seen the Galactic Centre. Um, doing my own research on the internet one person that I came back to again and again who's looked at this in great detail is John Major Jenkins uh, and I had the privilege of meeting him at the Megalithomania conference just recently in May. And some of his books are down here. These, these are the books that have inspired me, as well as various websites. And if anyone wants to look at those at the end of the talk, then you're welcome. Um, a lot of the Galactic Alignment information um, is thanks to John Major Jenkins. And uh, his wonderful book, The 2012 Story, gives a great overview as to how the, um, the discussions around 2012 went a little insane for a while, and are now, I think, perhaps coming back on track. But uh, given all of that, I'm going to allow myself a bit of freedom to talk about some of the more esoteric aspects and mytholo mythological um, viewpoints on 2012 with perhaps a, a more priv primitive mind. Um, we'll be looking at some, some archetypes. The still point of the turning world is an archetype that was referred to by T.S. Eliot in one of his classic poems, Burnt Norton, which is a very metaphysical poem. Um, the galactic centre in Sagittarius. Sagittarius is an astrological archetype, of course, with the archer pointing his arrow in a certain direction. We will see that the arrow of Sagittarius in the sky actually does point at the galactic centre. And the axis mundi is another archetype. The world axis, the idea that there is a, a direction perhaps a line, an alignment, which is very often symbolized in ancient cultures as a tree with its roots in the earth and its branches in the sky. This axis mundi is an axis and alignment, which we can tie in very easily with the alignment between the center of the galaxy, the sun and the earth in 2012. So those are some of the archetypes we'll be looking at. I'd like to start with this wonderful section from T.S. Eliot and uh, tell you how I came to this subject. First, I'll read it. At the still point of the turning world, neither flesh nor fleshless, neither from nor towards, at the still point, there the dance is. But neither rest nor movement, and do not call it fixity, where past and future are gathered, neither movement from nor towards, 
neither ascent nor decline. Except for the point, the still point, there would be no dance, and there is only the dance. This section from T.S. Eliot I used to read when I was a teenager studying English, and then I, I studied music. And I was always very drawn to this idea of, of a centre, the centre of a circle, the centre of a mandala, the centre of a spiral, a centre within ourselves, and in music also, we have the idea of a tonal centre, the one note from which all the other notes spring. Um, just looking here, across this banner behind me, we can see this Avalon Rising banner was made years and years ago, um, when a lot of the 2012 information was still in a state of flux and um, perhaps not as centred as it could have been, but we, we have all, all of these diagrams across here seem to have a centre. We start here, we have the labyrinth, which symbolises the journey of the soul in a meandering way, round and round, until finally reaching the still point at the centre. Here, the om, which is the musical idea of a single note from which all other notes arise. If I were to sing you one single note, you might think I was only singing one note. But if I sing that note in a certain way, I can bring out the higher overtones, which then create a chord. And it's from chords that we develop our sense of harmony in music and that music becomes more complex. So, Whilst singing the one single note, we're able to create the other notes, the higher notes that create the harmony. I'm just looking for the bit of the poem where it says that that's where, where everything comes from. Except for, the, except for the point, the still point, there would be no dance and there is only the dance. From the one comes the many. Mark Healy's point talk made a very interesting point about coherence and incoherence. I shall be a, attempt to be coherent here, but it's interesting that in astrology, the direction of Sagittarius, which is the direction in the sky where we find the galactic center, Sagittarius in Western astrology can be viewed as the sign that tends towards a center, towards a point of coherence. And Gemini, which is the direction of the galactic anti-center, the direction away from the center of the galaxy, is the direction at which we get random facts, random assortments of information, um, random firings of neurons, perhaps. Um, I don't mean to say that all Geminis are incoherent, <laughs> or that all Sagittarians are coherent. Um, the two sides of the same coin need each other. There's a reflexive relationship between those two. Here we have a picture of the galaxy, and at its center, there's a burning core that looks somewhat like a sun in this diagram. And our sun is located in a spiral arm here. And it's interesting, this is an interesting cosmic coincidence, and there are many of these surrounding us. An interesting cosmic coincidence is that our sun is between 25 and 27,000, perhaps 26,000 years from the galactic center. The galactic central bulge, we're told, is 25,000 years across. We're a bit further than that. So, light years, that is. So it takes light about 26,000 years to reach from the center of the galaxy to our solar system. And this is an interesting fact because 26,000 years is the amount of time that it takes for the precession of the equinoxes, which is, the, um, which is what's causing this alignment of the sun coming into alignment with the galaxy every 26,000 years, culminating as the Mayans saw it in 2012. As we look closer at the galaxy, we can see these two directions. The Sagittarius arm is here, and as Mark Healy was explaining, the sun, as it orbits the center of the galaxy, goes around this, this spiral. And we've recently passed out of the Sagittarius arm. 
the solar system itself as it goes on its 200 million year orbit around the galaxy. And the opposite direction to the Sagittarius arm would be over here. Um, so the constellation of Cygnus in the sky is an important constellation in terms of astrology and ancient astronomy because about 13,000 years ago, half a processional cycle ago, the pole star was contained within the constellation of Cygnus, which, is, as you can see, is pretty much opposite the Sagittarian direction. Here is a photograph of a galaxy, not ours, but a distant galaxy on its side, and that's what our galaxy would look like if we could look at it from a distance. You can see it's got a central bulge here, and this is the disk, the galactic disk. So this line across here is what we call the galactic equator, the equator of a galaxy. And spiral galaxies, there are different types of galaxy, but a lot of them are spiral galaxies, and our Milky Way galaxy is a spiral galaxy. Um, viewed side on, they look like this, somewhat like a flying saucer. And um, as we look at what the galaxy actually looks like, we'll be able to look at some interesting coincidences as to how ancient cultures might have seen the centre of everything. Um, it's very often depicted in shamanic mythologies, particularly from around Central America and North America, as being a bird of prey, an eagle. And we have the famous shamanic author Carlos Castaneda wrote many books about the eagle, the, uh, the devouring bird that lives at the centre of everything and kind of feeds on consciousness. It feeds consciousness out of itself and it devours our own consciousness as well. We have this reciprocal relationship with the eagle, according to Castaneda. It was very exciting to me when I discovered the writings of Castaneda and was simultaneously looking at the, uh, at the galactic mythology that the eagle is seen as this devouring bird of prey that sits at the heart of everything. So whether or not Castaneda was aware of the galaxy, he was aware of a shamanic paradigm in which we can see that there's this kind of devouring consciousness at the heart of everything, which both feeds and devours. This is a slightly complex picture of the solar system and the galactic plane as it inter intersects the ecliptic. It's uh, much easier seen in the sky, but again, we can see the directions of uh, Sagittarius in this direction and Gemini here. And you can see that the galactic plane here aligns pretty much with the Sagittarius and Gemini direction. And our solar system intersects that at a direction of 60 degrees, which is a, a nice harmonic division of the circle into six. And looked up in the night sky, we can see this is as, as it would be viewed from the southern hemisphere, from where the Mayans were in Central America, Guatemala, Mexico. And we can see the constellations of Sagittarius and Scorpio here, the, uh, the tail of the scorpion kind of curling around here. And we have these dark clouds, as Mark was mentioning, which obscure our view of the center of the galaxy. It's very interesting that there is interstellar space dust between us and the center of the galaxy. Um, an interesting fact that I found from this book here, Fulvio Melia's book on the black hole at the center of our galaxy. Melia is an, an astronomer, a mainstream astronomer, and he is the guy who's been coordinating the, well, the recent efforts to get the galactic center recognized as containing a supermassive black hole. It does. There's now a, a scientific consensus on that. But I think at the time that the book was published, which was only a few years ago, merely I was at the forefront of astronomy there in declaring publicly that there is a supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy. And scientists and astronomers are now speculating that the black hole, massive as it is and at the very heart of the galaxy, is something necessary for the creation of the galaxy itself. 
So just as the Mayans may have seen the dark rift here, according to Jenkins, as the creation place, the cr place of the creation of everything, and the place where when the sun aligns with it, at the winter solstice 2012, it's aligning with the central creation place. Um, this can be seen in modern astronomy and science now to be more than mythological. Um, black holes suck in matter, but they also emit it at a massive rate, particularly when stars collide with each other as they fall into the black hole. They emit a lot of radiation. But um, I've read scientific speculations also that the black holes behave somewhat like quasars. Um, a quasar I is a, a distant object um, similar to a black hole that emits a great deal of radiation just as it sucks in matter. Um, so y you, can s you can see this black hole at the centre of the galaxy as being like a kind of cosmic recycling plant, if you like. It's sucking in and devouring stars and emanating radiation at very high frequencies. Um, we're not able to see these frequencies, but we can take photographs of, of it. And um, here is one from Melia's book. This is an astronomical photograph. And there in the center, you can see this incredibly bright luminosity. This is the plane of the galaxy running this way. And there's this very bright central core now, the space dust that intervenes between that core and us is of such a density that it blocks out visible light. Now, this means, if you think about it, that our eyes have evolved to not be able to, to see this incredibly bright light in the sky. And this is a, a wonderful cosmic coincidence. It brings us to what um, the, uh, the Glastonbury philosopher and uh, geometer John Martineau calls the anthropic principle. Well, it's a philosophical principle, but John is somewhat obsessed by it. He, he sees these cosmic coincidences around us all the time, around how our consciousness is tuned in with the cosmos around us. Why is it that our eyes are tuned to specific frequencies of light? Um, we, we can pick up X-ray frequencies. We can pick up um, frequencies below the infrared that enable us to photograph the galactic center. And we can also pick up very high frequencies at gamma rays. And, and um, there are frequencies where positrons annihilate with electrons. These subatomic particles are, are crashing into each other as, as these collisions are happening near the black hole and emitting extremely high frequencies, which if our eyes were tuned differently, Melia himself says, the astronomical, hard-nosed scientist tells us that if it wasn't for this coincidence that we can't see through the space dust, that it's of a certain density, then the, the black hole, or the, not the black hole, but the radiation emanating from it would appear about the same size as the full moon in the sky. We already have a wonderful cosmic coincidence, which is that the the moon and the sun appear to be the same size in the sky, which is when the moon, which is why when the moon crosses across the face of the sun, we get a total eclipse. Um, it's interesting, this speculation that the, the size of that bulge is about the same size as the sun and the moon. So we have this third entity. For millennia, we've seen the sun and the moon as being perhaps the masculine and the feminine, the, the light and the shade. And they're both the same size in the sky. Wonderful coincidence. We're kind of tuned into them, as we know. We're tuned into the cycles of the moon. And as Mark was mentioning, the electromagnetic activity on the sun is very intimately tied to the electromagnetic activity on the Earth. But now we have this, this third object, this distant black hole, that may somehow be responsible for us being here at all. Um, and it's interesting to see this center, this center of the galaxy, as being visualized as a, as a cosmic creation place, um, both in modern science and in ancient mythology. I've got some more photographs of it here. This is this huge explosion of uh, interstellar gas, clouds and different temperatures here, belts of temperature. In the very center, we have this very small dot, and that is the real center of it called Sagittarius A star, is what the astronomers call it. 
um, because it's in the direction of Sagittarius. Um, they called it that before they knew what it was. It was discovered in about 1930 when the Alexander Bell Company were laying telegraph cables across the ocean to be able to send telegraphs and later telephone calls um, transatlantic. And they were picking up static electricity, which was interfering with the uh, transmissions. So it seemed to be coming from a particular place in the sky. So they, they looked up into the sky and found it was coming from this area that they called Sagittarius A star. So they started training telescopes as best they could at the time on it and investigating. And over the years, it emerged that there, was, there were frequencies of radiation there which were interfering with the, uh, with the telephone calls and the, the telegraph messages. Um, another wonderful coincidence when you read up on this story is that they were transmitting at a certain frequency across the Atlantic, which meant it was harmonically entrained with the, with the frequencies from the galactic center. And this actually caused the problem. If they'd have been using different frequencies, then they might not have ever picked up the galactic center because it wouldn't have caused this problem of static interference. So it was, a, it was a coincidence of the frequencies that they were using that actually brought about the discovery of this object, Sagittarius A star, in about 1930, which is around the same time that Pluto was discovered. That's a diagram of it. And there's Sagittarius A star in the middle. Uh, there are various other objects which are mostly clouds of gas around it. Here's a lovely photograph. I, I was already thinking about the bird archetype when I bought Fulvio Emilio's book and started looking through it. Um, and it was quite exciting to see that this photograph of the galaxy again has this sort of something that looks a little bit like a flying bird. Um, you don't have to believe me on this. I'm, I'm sort of tying together quite a few archetypes in this talk and um, I'll be showing you photographs of all sorts of bird imagery, particularly bird of prey imagery, and just allowing all of us to speculate on why it is that birds of prey have such a, a resonance for us, shamanically. This is, this is actually a computer simulation of what a black hole looks like. Um, we have the, the darkness in the middle, and around it all of this radiation as matter collides at the event horizon of the black hole as it gets sucked in. So it's both very bright and very dark at the same time, and in a way it resembles an eclipse or the transit of something across a bright object. So another archetype that we can look at throughout this talk as we look at the images is of eclipses and see how similar they look to black holes. Um, we can also see, as, as we look back at that spiral galaxy, which is back a few images ago, but we know what a what a spiral galaxy looks like. It's got the centre and it's got these kind of spiralling arms coming out. It looks, it looks almost alive. To me it looks similar to a spider. And we have this uh, mythology of spider grandmother who weaves the universe, which we get from the Native American cultures, but other cultures worldwide as well. Um, also, uh, something I picked up from John Major Jenkins when he came and did his talk is that the word hurricane, the word that we have for a vast storm, comes from the Mayan language and it comes from Huru Khan, who is a deity associated with Hunab Ku, which is the end of the Mayan cycle and the, the alignment with the center of the galaxy. So a hurricane looks remarkably like a galaxy as well. It has a center, a kind of still center, a still silent center around which there's this immense amount of activity. And this is another interesting kind of holographic coincidence, if you like, as above, so below. The, the things that are happening on Earth seem to be mirrored by what's going on in the heavens. Now, John Major Jenkins is, is very, very careful because he's attained quite a, a level of academic credibility. He's very careful when people challenge him with the question, what could the Mayans have known about astronomy they could only see with the naked eye he's very careful to say that well they could see the dark rift they could see that that was an important place they could they could perhaps that that was where the sun 
when it rose in 2012 would align with the dark rift. But he actually says that they used this mythology of a black hole. They talk about the sun aligning with a black hole. And he's been very careful and said, oh, well, the black hole means the dark rift. It means this sort of cleft shape. But I would like to speculate, because I'm not a scientist, that this archetype of a black hole or a, a still center that creates a lot of chaos and movement and, and radiation, if you like, around it, is fundamental to consciousness and it's fundamental to the way that the cosmos works. It's reflected in the storms and the hurricanes that we see on Earth. Um, it's reflected in our, in our own consciousness and possibly by the, the near-death experience as well. Um, I've never been particularly fond of, of speculations of what might happen in 2012, and as we're approaching it, it I think it's becoming uh, increasingly important to uh, avoid um, sort of fixed predictions as to what's going to happen. But um, in all the plethora of information that, that Jeff Stray has put out over the years about what different people are saying about 2012, one thing that really resonated with with me was the idea that we could be on the verge of a, a mass near-death experience. Um, I, I really en enjoy that idea, partly because from my own personal story, when I was about 13, I, I had a fever. Um, it was only measles, but it, for about three nights in a row, I had a recurring dream. And that dream was that there was this incoherent babble going on, little peons of information talking to each other saying things like two plus two equals five, no, two plus two equals three, no, two plus two equals... And it was incoherent, it, it wasn't quite logical, it didn't make sense. And I visualised it a as a lot of little chattering twigs. <laughs> little twigs, little insignificant things all, all babbling away. And from behind them, while they were speaking, there arose this vast circle of white light which encompassed them. And as they were speaking in and incoherently chattering away, they found coherence because they became swallowed up in this vast consciousness that was kind of dawning behind them. And I remember saying to my mother, I think there's going to be an amazing event in the future. I think there's a big party. And I think I'm going to be there. And after that, I started to hear the uh, Aguilas fraternity and other people talking about the Cosmic Party 2012 and I thought what is this? This this reminds me of, of my of my vision and my idea that there would be a, a vast meeting of people coming into coherence and uh, it was very interesting to hear, hear Mark mention in a way that, that I hadn't seen before this idea of the incoherent babble all kind of coming together into a point of coherence and it's that still point the centre of everything that gives us that, that coherence, I would like to suggest. And um, for those of you who are into astrology, um, it's, it's something that I've, I've arrived at through my own research, is the idea that we can look at Sagittarius and the arrow of Sagittarius as symbolizing that, that coherence of, of things. This is another photograph of our galaxy. That that's the galactic plane running left, right there. But there's this emission from behind as well, which looks somewhat like the tail of a bird. And as I saw this photograph of the galaxy, it was tremendously exciting. We have this glowing, glowing center, the wings coming out at either side and the fanning tail. And it almost looks as if it's flying towards us. This is, this is a, a photograph taken as positrons and electrons annihilate each other near the galactic center, they, uh, they emit a radiation at a specific frequency. And if you photograph that frequency, you get, you get this wonderful picture. Anyone want to disagree with me that that looks a bit like a flying bird with a kind of conscious head flying towards us? <laughs> Does to me, anyway. I'd like to look at some other archetypes as to what this still point could have been seen as over the years. Um, archetypes that resonate with Masonic imagery as well. The, the eye in the sky, the idea of a, a consciousness in the sky that observes everything. That could be the sun. There's a wonderful book by, is it Jeffrey Ash, called Son of God, S-U-N of God, that makes a strong case that the sun is a conscious being and that our earth is also a conscious being and there's this electromagnetic communication going on. But 
the eye in the sky could be more than the sun. And um, I'm going to keep coming back to Mark's talk because I've just heard it and I love what he said, that we're entering into a galactic paradigm now. We're, we're starting to see that we've not only got the Earth and the sun and the solar system, but we've got this, this third thing beyond that, um, that is the creation place and that that has its own consciousness. It's the, the eye in the sky and this is a, a very ancient very ancient archetype. Um, I was also struck during Mark's talk by the, uh, the lovely coincidence that the, the Mayan glyph for the number zero is an eye. So the, the zero point, the point from which things emerge, was envisaged by them as an, as an eye. So in other words, it, it has consciousness. And there's the eye and the pyramid, not in its Masonic form, but as depicted by, by Gong, the great psychedelic band. I am a musician. And uh, David Allen did uh, an album of drones, um, Seven Drones it was called, which was supposed to represent the seven chakras, one drone for each chakra. And just to come back to this idea of the drone, I, I have done talks at other festivals, um, and I probably will, once 2012 is out of the way, I'll be able to get back to talking about what I really love talking about, which is the drone this still point in music where you have a single tone from which everything else emerges, which of course is symbolized here on the banner behind me by the, by the Om. And by the Egyptians, interestingly, as the goose, the great honking goose from which everything emerges. The honk of the goose, the resonance of that was viewed as, as uh, the creation, the creation Om. Um, and as I'm tying some poetry into this, I'd just like to drop in my favourite Ezra Pound quote. Ezra Pound is a great friend of T.S. Eliot. And in one of his craziest poems, a translation of a Roman text, difference of opinion with Ligdemus, he said, one must have resonance and sonority like a goose. <laughs> Seems like a very silly thing to write. So there's the eye in the sky and the, uh, and the centre of the eye. So, are those concentric circles the system? Or are they something bigger than that, something wider? We have some other concentric circles here, and we can look at another still point in the sky, which is the pole star. Polaris is our pole star at the moment, and there is one point there in, in the middle, I think that's it, which doesn't move very much. Polaris is so close to the, um, the axis of the spinning of the Earth. At this point in precession, we have a pole star that's very, very close, so that as we take a time-lapse photograph of the pole star, we can see it still, and all the others seem to revolve around it. Now, the, the central thesis of John Major Jenkins' book, Maya Cosmogenesis 2012, that um, has been kind of buried un under a lot of the... Uh, a lot of the speculations on 2012, and he doesn't often come back to it himself, is the idea of Seven Makor, this Mayan deity, being displaced from its perch and replaced by the, uh, the, the sun and galactic alignment deities of Hunapu and Hunabku. Um, Seven Makor according to Jenkins, represents the pole star. And northern hemisphere cultures, um, particularly kind of Siberian, Mongolian shamans and so on, viewed the pole star as the place where the souls of the dead go after death, so that there'd be a kind of pathway to that still point. And the still point would be viewed really as a kind of god. Um, we could define god as being the still point of the turning world. It's, it's as good a de definition as any, and um, the still point within us that we can arrive at through meditation is our connection with that still point, that still point with God. But looking up in the sky, if we see a place that appears to be still, and we're uh, an ancient sky-watching culture, we're going we're gonna to think that that's where God is. And so th that still point of the, the North Star would have been viewed by northern cultures as being a very important place in the sky and perhaps the road to the, to the other world, perhaps the underworld. And then, of course, we have the Mayans. We're not
at the Pole Star. They were on the other side of the planet and they were looking at the dark rift and at the centre of the galaxy. And in Myocosmogenesis 2012, John Major Jenkins' speculative thesis that uh, he's quite careful not to, uh, not to mention too loudly in his academic conferences is that the Mayans may have initiated at sites like Izapa other shamans from around the world who may have travelled there into the idea that there is a, a greater cosmic centre than the Pole Star and uh, in the Popol Vuh, which is their creation myth you have this I idea of Seven Makor being this, this ego, really, that thinks it's a god and has to realise that it isn't because there's a greater centre. And Seven Macor represents the Big Dipper constellation, which then, of course, as we all know, the, uh, the plough points to the pole star. It's, it's, it's in the north. So the initiations that could have happened at, at Izapa, according to Jenkins, would be that this cosmic centre would be pointed out as being the true centre. So we have these the idea of different centres and one being supplanted by another. Um, it's similar to the Copernican revolution that Mark was mentioning earlier, where we see the centre of the solar system is the sun and we go around the sun. But we have a, a larger cosmic centre, which is the centre of the galaxy. There's a, a lovely, yet another cosmic coincidence. It's a coincidence as far as I know. If there are any astronomers here who can clarify this for me, I've always been interested in this one. If we look at an ephemeris of the pole star, the pole star is located, Polaris is at 28 degrees Gemini. That's almost exactly the galactic anti-center. So that means that if you're out in that stone circle with Dave, the astronomer, at night, he was doing these wonderful star talks. If you had Polaris behind you, and you just pointed in the opposite direction, you would be pointing in the direction of the centre of the galaxy. So at the moment, they're exactly opposite each other. Um, it's a very interesting opposition, again, between Gemini and Sagittarius, the point of incoherence and the point of coherence. I'm going to whiz through this because I believe that most people these days have, have heard of the procession of the equinoxes and the idea that over a 6,000 year cycle, the, uh, the skies shift um, and that it's the end of that 26,000 year cycle that the Mayans were pinpointing with their 2012 date. Is there anyone here who hasn't come across the idea of the procession of the equinoxes? Only one person, one or two, okay. Well over a 26,000 year cycle um, the the equinoxes actually change the, s the signs that, that they're in. So the spring equinox is in Aries at the moment, but that changes. Um, this is why modern astrology is, is kind of out of tune with ancient astrology. And uh, when we say something is actually at 27 degrees Sagittarius, it's actually, it's actually at 6 degrees Sagittarius because everything is shifting. And this is because the Earth is wobbling on its axis like a, sp a spinning top. Although the, even that is an outmoded paradigm now because uh, Walter Crittenden has shown fairly convincingly that the proces procession is caused by the twinning of our sun with another star. It's in a binary system with Sirius, interestingly. Um, but whatever's causing it, we have this shifting of the heavens, which means that different stars rise on the horizon at different times of the year. and so. Also, the pole star shifts, and this particular diagram is showing where's Polaris. You see, you can see the star Polaris is right on this circle, whereas the uh, Deneb, which is in the constellation of Cygnus, is a little bit off the circle, so that would have moved about a little bit more. But uh, about 13,000 years ago, which is half a processional cycle ago, our pole star would have been Vega, and before that it was Deneb. And that's the circle depicted again. I'm going to whiz through procession because it's it's easily it's it's easily investigated. But the uh, the basic point is that as the sun rises at winter solstice 2012, it has the galactic centre directly behind it, and that Jen it was Jenkins who really put on the map the theory that that was why the Mayans chose 2012 as the beginning point or the end point of their calendar because during this procession
depth caused by the wobble of the Earth on its axis, the Sun will have different stars behind it as it, as it rises. So as it rises in 2012, it has the galactic centre directly behind it. Now this, this led to a welter of misinformation because I, I was reading it only two years ago, I think, in, in, in our local Avalon magazine, saying at winter solstice 2012 there will be this unique event that only happens once every 26,000 years. And um, that, that really is very inaccurate because precession happens so slowly that really over a 30-year period the uh, sun can be said to have the galactic centre directly behind it. So it's been happening since about 1980 and it's continuing to happen. And the central point of, of this sort of window of alignment was around 1998. So we can say, well, the Mayans may not have been able to calculate very exactly um, when the exact galactic alignment was. And the sun is a, about a degree wide in the sky anyway. So you're going to have a few years, really, where the sun is, has actually got the galactic centre behind it. It's happening every winter solstice. It happened last winter solstice. And of course, we had this wonderful galactic alignment then, which was that we had a total eclipse of the moon on the winter solstice. So we had the sun and the moon and the center of the galaxy all in alignment. And that was very close to 2012. But also, the, there was a, a, a full moon solstice eclipse in 1999 as well. That was also a galactic alignment event. So we've had this focus on 2012 because that was the date that the Mayans chose. But we have, to, we have to remember that that galactic alignment is happening every year. We can count ourselves very lucky that we are the generation that is here to live through that galactic alignment and to be, and that's a wonderful coincidence in itself. It's a great coincidence that I'm here to tell you that and that we're all here to experience it and that we are actually here at the Cosmic Party, all of us. Um, I'd like to get back to our archetypes a little bit again. Um, we're at the Sunrise Festival. Now, when the sun rises in the morning, this is the return of the light. Um, sun sunrise is such a wonderful archetype, a wonderful metaphor for the dawning of consciousness, the turning point, the coming of the light again. Anyone who's spent a night in a deep, dark forest at Sawain, perhaps tripping on mushrooms, waiting for the return of the sun, well, no, just, just what a powerful archetype the return of the light is. Um, I have, and I was terrified, and I couldn't wait for the sun to come up. <laughs> Avalon rising. This is another wonderful archetype. What is Avalon? Avalon is the summer lands, the land of the eternal summer. Um, the ancient Celts, and let's, let's come back to our own mythology here in the Druidic mythology. The ancient Celts viewed paradise or this eternal golden age. They believed in a golden age. It's, it's also been known since Roman times as the Saturnalia. This is an archetype of a place where the, the light is very, very strong. This, this archetype actually comes, I believe, from my researches and particularly from Jenkins's work. Um, Jenkins's work with Walter Cruttenden, who discovered the binary twinning of the sun and Sirius. This idea of the yugas, the world ages, we're coming out of the Kali Yuga, which is the darkest time, the darkest time in Indian Vedic mythology, the darkest time for human consciousness, and we're coming back into the light. So the alignment of the sun, the winter solstice being the darkest time of the year, that alignment of the sun with the center of the galaxy, which is this dark place, let's not forget, with the black hole, even though it creates all this light, we've passed or are passing through the darkest time and heading back towards a golden age. That, I believe, is the, is the archetypal New Age explanation. It's very, very ancient. It's more than just going into the dawning of the age of Aquarius. It's the idea that we're, we're coming towards some, some great fruition of, of light. That, but according to the Yuga theory, that's in 13,000 years' time. We're only just turning the corner out of the darkness. Dark and light are two halves of the same coin, however, so we can celebrate, just as we celebrate the winter solstice as the turning of the year, even though it's a dark point, we're celebrating the light when we celebrate the darkness. Um, anyone here 
ever been to any other ceremonies? Did you have any experiences to do with the darkness and the light? The, 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 the light is, is, is a very important, um, the return of the light is a very important metaphor in the ayahuasca shamanic ceremonies and um, I've experienced that and there's this immense gratitude for the light, immense gratitude that the light is created out of the darkness. Um, and this is something that resides very deep in our, in our subconscious. I'm going to whiz through that. That's just the ephemera showing us that the opposite direction to the galactic center is where Polaris is at the moment, 28 Gemini. And here's the astrological wheel of the year. Sagittarius at the top. Gemini at the bottom. The galactic center is located actually in the sky between, well, in very early Sagittarius and the tail of the scorpion. There's an arrow. Do you see that arrow on the tail of the scorpion? And there's also an arrow on Sagittarius. It's interesting that those arrows kind of point the direction of the galactic center. It's almost as if the galactic center has been encoded from very ancient times into our Western astrology there. The, the sting of the, the tail of the scorpion points at the galactic center, as does the uh, arrow of Sagittarius, who was in Vedic astrology, uh, symbolized as Krishnal, the archer. There's the sun rising, as you can see, in a particular astrological position Capricorn there that's the actual winter solstice it's as we tip from late Sagittarius into early Capricorn that's when the winter solstice is so it would also be correct to say that the sunrise a few days before winter solstice is also rising with galactic center behind it and is perhaps slightly more accurate this is how fast the galactic center is progressing with precession we can see we're at just just beyond 27 degrees Sagittarius in tropical astrology. So it's six degrees Sagittarius, or perhaps later than that now, seven or eight, um, in terms of where we're looking in the sky, and in terms of what we call tropical astrology, which is this, this fixed thing that's a bit out of date, which astrologers still use. It's 27 degrees Sagittarius. So if you're, if you're looking at the Earth chart, and you want to find the galactic center there, just go to 26, 27, 28 degrees Sagittarius and you'll find the galactic center and you might be able to find resonances on your, on your birth chart there. Yes, I'll take a question. Yeah, that shift is the shift of precession. So... Mm, well, if it was, if if you put a few more numbers in at the end, you'd see that's pretty pretty regular. You've you've got you've got two fifty twos in a row, but that's because one of them's probably fifty two, and then a two, and then fifty two, and then eight, and then so on. It's not a bit. There's not a big shift every year. Degrees fifty nine minutes, yes, and then sixty minutes is back to zero again. So twenty seven and yeah, okay, six. There's sixty minutes. Right, yes, okay, I, 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 w I will take questions at the end. Um, this is a birth chart of 2012 itself. I had a good look at this because I'm trained in Western astrology and I wanted to look at whether there was anything particularly significant about the, the chart for winter solstice 2012. Couldn't find very much, but the one interesting thing that again is, is sort of spanning the, this two or three year period at the moment and, and is, is ongoing is the uh, square of Uranus and Pluto, which any astrologer would tell you is going to cause big upheavals and the kind of Arab Spring uprisings and the so, sort of big political changes that we're seeing at the moment could could be due to that if you if you believe in pr predictive astrology, which I'm I'm not going to try and defend predictive astrology because I don't do it really, but. Um, one one myth was that all the planets in the solar system line up in 2012. Anyone heard that one? Well, yeah, it's rubbish. <laughs> here, here we have just a, a lovely diagram of how we can look within and without at the same time. We, we have the Earth at the front there and a, a meditating human being with a, a circle of light around the head and then looking into, into the sky and into the galaxy 
and not forgetting that as we look at the at the still point in the distance we can equally look inward into the still point within ourselves and uh, I think it's more than a metaphor to suggest that our very consciousness is dependent on the alignments that are going on sometimes very synchronistic very coincidental alignments um, for example, you know, the fact that the sun and the moon are the same size in the sky or that the pole star is exactly opposite the, the galactic centre. There are all sorts of things that astronomers can't really explain. But um, I would like to suggest that if it wasn't for these extraordinary harmonic alignments that are going on, then our consciousness could not arise in the first place to wonder at it all. This is what's called the anthropic principle, and I think you can take a kind of harm harmonic viewpoint on the anthropic principle, which is to say that it, requ it requires quite a finely tuned universe where things are coincidentally resonating with each other for consciousness to arise and for us to have consciousness. It's a ridiculous notion to those of us in the new paradigm to think that we human beings are the only creatures that are conscious and that everything else is dead matter. Consciousness is everywhere. We have it, but these alignments themselves are, in a way, conscious events and conscious beings. And Jenkins says this about Hunab Ku. Hunab Ku is viewed as a kind of goddess, deity, but it's also a time. It's also a time when everything comes into kind of fulfillment and resonance, and we're living through that time. And he says it in that book, which I highly recommend. I recommend all of his books. That's the cycle of, of Bactoons. I won't go into the Mayan calendar because it's been done quite a lot and I haven't got a great deal of time. Also, a picture of Izapa, which is this winter solstice aligned temple that a lot of the, uh, the research on 2012 focuses around Izapa. Thanks to the discovery that uh, viewed from Izapa, the, the sunrise there lines up with the center of the galaxy and the whole temple seems to have been built for that event which is now. And there it is, that's where the sun rises in June and in December it rises along the edge of a mountainside. Um, let's not forget to come back, back home again, that um, although we can see the sun rising there, that, that's the galaxy. Oops. Six thousand BC at the top, the galaxy would have been right up in the sky as the sun rose. But at AD twenty twelve, in the years around it, the the dark rift in the centre of the galaxy is right behind the sun. But that's not only happening in South America; it's happening here. And we have some wonderful writers in Avalon. Uh, Nicholas Mann, who's done a lot of research on the energy of the Tor and the springs in Glastonbury, uh, has recently published a book called The Star Temple of Avalon, where just as we can see the sun rising here along the along the the hills in Izapa. Um, so along the side of the tour here, I shall turn this way. Viewed from St. Edmund's Mound, which is an artificial mound in Glastonbury, we call it Windmill Hill, there's a council estate there, but every, every winter solstice a group of people go there to watch the sun roll up the side of the tour. And there are these terraces alongside the tour and uh, Nicholas Mann's um, thesis is that th these terraces were not only used for agriculture, uh, perhaps not at all, that, that those, they're kind of notches so that you can view the sun as it rises up the side of the tour and as it rolls up and appears here from St. Edmund's Mound, then uh, at this time in history it will have the galactic centre directly behind it. So in Glastonbury at winter solstice, um, if you're wondering where to be and you're, you happen to be in Glastonbury, you can go up to St. Edmund's Mound and watch, watch that event. That's a view of the galactic alignment. This is now a very famous diagram and most talks on 2012 have this, this diagram, the sun aligning with the galactic plane over a period of time and getting closer and closer as we get to 2012. The period of the alignment, as I remind you, is a good sort of 30 years because it takes a good while for the sun to pass through the galactic equator and it actually gets a little bit because because the galactic center is a little bit kind of further down here the the Sagittarius A star black hole that I was mentioning uh, is kind of a bit further down sort of here as the sun comes 
through the galactic equator and towards this part of the galactic disk, slightly closer to Sagittarius A star. So there are some complications here and some points of detail which you can get really into, and I don't mind discussing later if anyone wants to, but that's the, that's the basic alignment that we're going through now. So there we are, you can see in 1998 the sun was right. But, but that line is a kind of artificial line, which is a kind of midpoint of the galactic plane. You know, it's a very fine point of detail to try and say exactly when the alignment was happening. It's happening over a long period of time. Yes, and there's the galactic center slightly. As the sun comes along here, along the ecliptic, the distance from the galactic center here in about, is it 2026 or something? Will actually be slightly nearer the galactic center. That GC is where the black hole is all happening. So there, again, <laughs> mirrored in uh, Mark Healy's talk, he used the same picture. This is the, uh, the lunar eclipse of 1999, and we, we had a similar one last year where we have the moon and the sun and the earth all in a straight line. And that was the birth chart for that time. It was a, lo a lovely, interesting birth chart, but I haven't got time to go into it. How am I doing for time? Has anyone got the time? Because Great, okay, I'm gonna have to whiz through this. This, this next bit is, is where we get into some of the ways that ancient peoples and shamanic cultures might have viewed the center of the, of the galaxy and some of the archetypes involved, which is some of the more original stuff, I, I think. Yes. I'm sorry, it's so long since I did this talk. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry, that's the full moon on the winter solstice in 99. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, this, this is a, a diagram from the Mayan mythology of this kind of stick which represents the world axis called the fire drill being ground and all of this activity, this friction happening here. So this area here represents the galactic center and this axis is the axis of Sagittarius and Gemini galactic anti-center here and the galactic center here and this is mirrored in um, Vedic mythology by this the churning of the Milky Ocean which of course is the Milky Way and again you have this this kind of this podium here being spun round and round and you would again you'd get this kind of friction down here at the still point and then at the anti-center we have this perhaps meditating being and we have similarly in Egypt, the, uh, before they built any building, they would do this ritual called the stretching of the cord. And the stretching of the cord involved putting this kind of spike into the earth and, and spinning it, which again represents the same archetype. So this book here, Galactic Alignment, starts to take things out of the, the Mayan cosmology and right the way around the world. Um, into ways that the galactic center could have been viewed by ancient cultures. And it's a very convincing thesis, and there's a lot more research to be done on this. Jenkins didn't manage to fit that much into galactic alignment because it's a huge subject. Once you start looking at the idea of the center of a circle or, the, or a world axis, and you start to look at this galactic paradigm, you find out it's been around for a very, very long time, and it's been known about, particularly in India. That's the dark rift as it looks in the sky, and there it is symbolized by kind of cosmic caiman or alligator or crocodile in, um, in Mayan mythology. And again, it looks like a tree. And at the galactic anti-center here, we have Seven Macor, who represents the Big Dipper or the Pole Star in the Gemini direction. And that's the Sagittarius devouring mouth of the crocodile. Let's remember the devouring black hole. And uh, here, Seven Makor, the polar deity, is being venerated on his perch, but at the other end is the, is the crocodile. And then he's shot down from his perch. This is all in the Popol Vuh, the, the Mayan creation myth. And look what's down here at the bottom, the scorpion, Scorpio right next to Sagittarius. 
So it's a very convincing case that John Major Jenkins has made for this galactic mythology, and uh, he wasn't taken seriously for years by Mayan archaeologists because they, they didn't want to look at the idea that the Mayans would have an astronomical mythology. It's, um, it's a bit of a turning point for anyone who's researching mythology to start to see just how much mythology does reflect what's going on in the, in the skies. Um, in, in this book, The Star Temples of Avalon, um, Gwynap Neith, the, uh, the god of the underworld, the Celtic god of the underworld, is equated with, with Orion. And so we can start to see that in mythologies around the world, astronomical events were kind of personalized, um, given, given gods and stories. And that's the solar god being devoured there as the sun conjuncts the galactic center in his upper. I think that's the stretching of the cord again. And the, the, Indi the Egyptian zodiac at Dendera. Again, it's sort of all laid out in a circle at the center. And this is the goddess Nut or Nuit who represents the galaxy in Egyptian mythology. She's viewed as a kind of arch, the arch of the heavens. And she has these three disks, which we're told are the sun rising, reaching its zenith and setting. But she, she, she also is mythologized to devour the sun at this end and then to, and then it's reborn again from, from her womb. And you can see, really, it's at the point where she's reborn that it sheds all this light. So this ties in very much with the Mayan idea of the rebirth of the sun. And the Egyptians may have been depicting that as well. Um, this is conjecture on my part. I'd, I've not seen anyone else draw the Egyptian Nuit mythology together with, with the Mayan, but it's fairly obvious once you start looking for it. Um, there she is again, sort of overarching everything on this Egyptian picture. And here we have the winged disc. Now the winged disc, I think, is a wonderful symbol for the galaxy. As we saw before, when it looked a bit like a flying saucer with wings, you have this kind of bulge, this glowing bulge in the center, and then the wings on either side. And it's, it's, it's been an, an archetype of consciousness for years. Um, it's not often been claimed against the galaxy, but I'm pretty sure in, in my mind that it does once you start looking at ancient mythologies as, as being potentially galactic, and you start to see it everywhere. The winged disc of Horus, and it's one of the most ubiquitous images everywhere. It's, it's on the mini metro. <laughs> the Nazis used it. Um, it's it, it's a power symbol. It's the power symbol, really. The winged disc. It's here. It's here behind me, at the top. At the top of the Caduceus, as we have the sort of spiraling snakes, perhaps representing. DNA or the double helix spirals and then we have the wings and here sometimes this this bulge at the top of the staff is much bigger and it ends up looking like a winged disc on the caduceus itself and that's the god Horus the bird headed god bird of prey whose wings are the winged disc now that's not Egyptian that's actually Native American There's the, uh, the caduceus, again, with the winged disc and the twin snakes. Three different winged discs. I can't quite see the screen from here, but the middle one's Central America, and the Mayans, and the top one's Egypt. That one is Central American, again. You can see very clearly now a circle. There's a bird of prey with its wings. It seems to be a shamanic archetype that crops up everywhere. Whether or not these cultures were communicating with each other, we can say cultures did communicate a lot more in the past. There's more and more evidence for this, that people traveled a lot. But uh, you've only got to study Jungian psychology to realize that archetypes arise spontaneously in human consciousness anyway around the planet. Here's a shield with, again, a sort of winged disc. Again, that one's South American. I love this shield. This is Navajo shield symbol. And I love this black hole right in the center of it with the wings coming out on either side. It's a, a 
This is one of the Nazca pictures in the desert in Nazca in Peru. We have a face here, conscious face in the disc coming out either side and the tail. So if you remember back to that picture at the beginning of the galaxy, perhaps this is the galaxy written very large on the desert in Nazca. Syria in, a, in uh, the Middle East has a, a winged disc. It's got little kind of horns at the top. And you get the winged disc here at the top of the, the staff. You get the, this is ancient Chaldea. You get the axis symbolized by the staff here. And at the top of it, we have a winged disc symbol. It's extraordinary once you start looking for these things. They're, they're absolutely everywhere. Uh, there's the world tree. Again, Chaldean. And again at the top, a winged disc and the fanning tail. The fanning tail here is, uh, I think this is, a, this is a man with a kind of skirt. He's wearing a kind of skirt, and that's like the fanning tail of a bird of prey. Here we have priests venerating this winged disc in the sky, which looks like a kind of cosmic being. And one of my favorites here, right in the middle, we actually have the archer Sagittarius himself with his bow being depicted as a winged disc. How much more evidence do we need that the winged disc is a galactic symbol? And of course the Americans and many other empires or aspiring empires have used the eagle, the bird of prey and its wings as power symbols really. The Masonic, as we know, we had a wonderful talk here by Robert Baval on the Masonic symbolism of America. And uh, not content with one arrow, this eagle is clutching a whole, a whole load of them. And here is the constellation of Aguila or Aquila in the sky. We can see this rising in the sky at the moment. Dave was pointing it out from the stone circle. It's very near to the galactic center. In fact, all of this blue stuff behind is actually the kind of the dust of the, the space dust and the, the stars of the, the Milky Way. So we, we actually have a, a constellation of the eagle which slightly confuses things. I mean, I'd like to say that the eagle is a galactic symbol, but there's a nice coincidence that we have the eagle co constellation right near the galactic center as well. And uh, Garuda is the cosmic guardian of the gateway in Hindu mythology. And, uh, I think Krishna now has to get past Garuda, the eagle, in order to get the Soma from the center, center of the galaxy. That's from Jenkins again, that idea. This is uh, Vishnu, the great god Vishnu, one of the three major, major deities of, of, of creation, really. And his navel here at the center of the picture, I'm sorry the picture is a little bit blurred, but the navel of Vishnu in Vedic astrology is the center of the galaxy. So anyone who does you a Vedic birth chart will find the navel of Vishnu on it, and it will be an important place to look at on the birth chart. Now this is a total eclipse. And a lot of the pictures that I, that I got there of winged disks were actually from a website which was bringing together all of these winged disks and um, imagery around the eclipse and claiming that because the corona around an eclipse tend to look sometimes like wings, that all of these winged disks definitely must have represented eclipses. Um, and I'd like to go one step further and say that eclipses and galactic alignment are somehow, you can sort of unify these really into one grand theory. And there's a wonderful, there's a wonderful chapter in galactic alignment where you can see that, let's come back to the nodes again, and apologies for my mistake earlier, the, uh, the south node of the moon, which is where you can have a, an eclipse, you can also have an eclipse at the north node. The south node of the eclipse was exalted in ancient Islam Islamic mythology at the point where the galactic center was, which basically is saying that if you had a, an eclipse which was aligned with the galactic center, that was considered to be a very, very special event. And uh, it still is. So anyone who wants to do any kind of uh, uji juji around a specific date, you couldn't pick a better date than a, than a galactic eclipse, a galactically aligned eclipse to do it. Um, we simply had an open mic night at the assembly rooms and we all sang songs about peace and love and did our usual thing on the uh, 
on, on the winter solstice and it was great. That's uh, a solar eclipse in M1, when, which was also an aligned eclipse. And there, that's the, that's an actual photograph of our galaxy. Just after you'd seen all those, all those birds of prey images, I wanted to show back to an, uh, an actual original photograph so that we can see the, the resonances between the archetype and the actual reality that's going on up there in the sky. Highly recommend this book, Carlos Castaneda's Fire from Within. There's an eagle flying in the sky and a sunrise or a sunset. The eagle's casting its shadow on the ground. The two people up there looking at it. Um, Carlos Castaneda never mentions the galaxy, but he does talk interestingly about the balance of masculine and feminine. And uh, says that, can we read that? Don Juan said that he was da 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 da. His reasoning was correct and was guided by the sorcerer's knowledge that the universe is markedly female and that maleness being an offshoot of femaleness is almost scarce, thus coveted. This is a slightly paranoid Castanadian view that uh, the male warriors were having to fight this, uh, this kind of devouring female entity that was the eagle. It's a little bit misogynist if you look at it from a fear-based perspective. But it, it, it's, it's actually, uh, it's very interesting if you think that, you know, we start, we all start in the womb as being female and it, it takes a change in our chromosomes for us to become male. So um, Don Juan made a digression and commented that perhaps that, that scarcity of males is the reason for men's unwarranted dominion on our planet. I wanted to remain on that topic, but he went ahead with his story. Da, 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 da. I found that very interesting, and, and um, if I were to talk about a paradigm shift, I th it's about getting the balance of the sexes back, really, and uh, venerating the female again, at, at least as certainly as being equal to the male, but also as, as the creator of, of everything. Um, this idea of a father creator doesn't quite resonate when you start looking at this sort of feminine symbolism of this vast black womb-like hole at the center of the galaxy which, which seems to have much more markedly feminine properties than it does than it does masculine and there's a Sheila Nagig from one of our British churches a cosmic yoni and there's another one so bringing it all back home to Druidry and back home this is from a, a, a book of the Mabinogion and there's the galaxy Ariantrod the goddess of the galaxy and uh, I think that's Mab Abmathonwi doing his his magic with the and he's pointing right at the still point of the of the galaxy with his mushrooms growing all around him. Let's not forget that um, Jenkins hints in his book that if you had taken the right psychotropic substances in South America and you actually looked up at the dark rift, then maybe those filters would come down and maybe we'd actually be able to see the galactic center as this giant glowing disk that it is um, if the veil were lifted. Um, stone circles aligned to the winter solstice, we all know that. Aligned north-south, well Polaris is opposite the winter solstice, so that's interesting. So okay, we, we've heard a lot in megalithomania about how British stone circles are aligned to solstices, they're aligned to cosmic events, they're aligned north-south. Well, let's not forget that they're also, by definition, therefore galactically aligned also. That's a picture of a quasar and the idea that, uh, to not forget that as, as, the, uh, as the black hole is devouring, it's also giving out as well in the form of light and very high frequency radiation. And let's not forget, to come back to resonance, um, that high frequencies create low frequencies. Thought creates reality. Um, if we actually create very high frequency vibrations, then as they interact with each other through a process of beat frequencies, we create the lower frequencies. So the lower worlds are created from the higher worlds. Um, matter is created from consciousness. Um, and higher frequencies are created at the galactic center, um, which then resonate on a lower level. Dance me through to the stillness, to the point where the motion begins. Dance me through to the silence, to the edge where the world begins. I'm coming back to the very end, and I've got to go to a gig and play some Welsh music. Um, for some reason, I, I like to come back to the starting point of things. Um, 
my family are Welsh and my father's side is, um, we're going to be getting together in the Welsh Nationalist Edward and Earth Energies field. If anyone wants to help me network this, for the first time in 2012, interestingly, there's going to be a green field at the Welsh Edward, and I want there to be some talks along the lines of what happens here. So if anyone can, can help me with that, then please do. It has to be in the Welsh language, however. So that's going to be interesting. And I might have to do a talk like this in Welsh, which would be interesting. But uh, there's a tent down there, and I've got to go to it. There's also more than one universe. Um, the uh, galactic paradigm is much bigger than us, but there are all these uh, galaxies as well. There's even more than one galaxy, and they're all co potentially colliding with each other. And our, our galaxy is set to collide with the Andromeda galaxy. So when those two galactic centers meet, that'll be yet another big cosmic event, so it just gets bigger and bigger. That's a quote from E.E. E. Cummings. Listen, there's a hell of a good universe next, that's next door. Let's go. So I'm going to wrap up very quickly and just say that I think that the, the greatest truths are very, very simple. And this is what, to me, the symbolism of the rainbow is all about. The rainbow is a very, very simple thing. It's also full of cosmic coincidences because rainbows, um, as John Martineau has shown us, actually show us in the sky the, uh, the orbits of Mars and Venus and, and Mercury and the Earth are all depicted in the geometry of the rainbow. But the rainbow also in biblical mythology is a reminder that... Uh, God will never allow the world to end in a flood again. <laughs> Let's hope not. Um, the rain does seem to have stopped. And I shall finish there. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for listening. I don't have any time for questions, I'm afraid. I, what time is it now? Harmony, uh, do, do you know what's going on? They are running to time, so, I'm, oh, well, it's 10 past. I could take a couple of questions, yes, if we could get the mic out to you. Uh, it was over here, Matt, the first one. Yeah, it's a nice um, cosmic coincidence for me personally, because yesterday I gave a talk about the eagle. Ah. Uh, in Glastonbury, oh, um, in the context, or the eagle, um, also the phoenix bird, in the context of the Glastonbury yes. zodiac. Oh, lovely! Um, and of course, you've got the tour there behind you, and the tours, yes. and, and the head of the eagle, of course, in the Glastonbury zodiac, is the is is right on the tour. Oh, great! Um, yeah. And there's the Glastonbury zodiac there. And there it is, yeah. So, um, but but um, just on, you made me see something. I talked about the Garuda bird yesterday, oh. and um, Krishna, who you also showed, but Krishna's often depicted flying on the back of the Garuda, right. spinning um, on his finger sometimes, or holding in his hand the fiercely revolving disc right. that the Garuda has to break through in order to steal the Ambrosia, the Amrita, from, right. from the gods. So it just I, was, I was talking about that fiercely revolving wheel as maybe being the Zodiac, but as you're speaking, that could equally well be the fiercely revolving energy of, of the galactic center so it could and might, but these yeah. things work on all levels we have a galactic level you know we've got storms here and, and we have we have the zodiac as well there are all these circles within circles but i think that the biggest paradigm that we've got is to work with really is the galactic one yeah and um i do think that that krishna is associated with sagittarius and therefore with that part in the sky so it does all seem to tie together yeah right thank you for yeah, that thanks any other questions or observations Yeah, just um, you're talking about the galactic center and how we can't normally see it through the yeah. veils of perception. And, um, you know, there's a long history in the, um, well, particularly in the Kabbalah, but in most initiated traditions, that once you reach a certain level of perception of second sight, you'll see the sun at midnight. Ah. When, you, when you spoke about, like, the Earth, the sun, and another sun, suddenly that made a lot of sense. That's the sun at midnight. It's That's not just great, an internal yeah. perception. And then when you're talking about the... Um, the uh, world tree and, and the um, eye at the top of the world tree, of course, you have that in Kabbalah. You have the Ein Sof, uh, the um, place of creation and destruction, the limitless light from which everything emanates. And, of course, Ayin in Hebrew is the eye, so it's, it's woven right in. And just can I Great. be heretic and suggest that that galactic, that gorgeous picture at the end with a purple that we're calling an eagle, galactic yeah. center like that, could yeah. it not also be a dragon? It looks like a pleosaur <laughs> with wings. And you Thank think you. how dragons are just as worked into absolutely. our mythology they as, are. A, as eagles, so perhaps yes. it's a dragon. Well, absolutely. Just, uh, 
I, I put a dragon. Your Welsh dragon there. There it is. Yeah. It, it was just there all along, really. I didn't yeah, quite know how to tie it in, but you did. Thank you. It's a dragon. <laughs> the dragon god guards the treasure of the pole star. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dragons are power symbols. Well, they're, they're kind of a, a cross between the eagle and the serpent, I think, the dragon, which um, the eagle and the serpent are both scorpionic um, archetypes, and it's the kind of lower and the higher aspects of Scorpio. And Scorpio is also points to the galactic center, so that's another way of looking at a dragon, a sort of reptilian, and the and then, you know, which is the lower self, and then the eagle is, is the kind of higher self. So a, a dragon's a kind of mixture of that that elevated flying bird and then the kind of more earthbound reptilian thing. Oh, I hate saying the word reptilian these days because of Mr. Ike. <laughs> but uh, le le let's, not, le let's not think of it that way. Okay. Um, and any other observations or comments? I'm probably going to have to finish. So thank you all for listening. I hope it's been enlightening and interesting. It's a vast subject. We have the whole of global mythology to look at here. There's a book here called Hamlet's Mill, which first sort of put this on the map. You know, it, it alludes to, to, a, to a, a, a vast galactic mythology that, that, that stretches around the whole planet. Um, galactic Alignment here by John Major Jenkins also alludes to it. There's plenty more research to do. One of the reasons I started doing these talks at all was not so much because I felt I had something to offer, although I did. It was for the kinds of observations that you three have just given me. So thank you. You know, we're all, we're all making this up as... Uh, and, and, and the more we can just start to think of it this way, then we, we can all start to, again, to just come to this point of coherence, find some coherence in all this madness of information that's surrounding us at the moment. So anyway, thank you all for listening. I'll finish there. <laughs>